Hi, everybody. This is uh, Dave Staus. I'm the co-practice group leader of Hush Blackwell's privacy and cybersecurity practice. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you for attending. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. I don't know if you've heard, but there's some bills out there in the privacy uh, universe, uh, and they're, they're, they're growing. The numbers are growing. We, we added one just last night to this presentation. Uh, so there's a lot to talk about here today, but before I get there, I do want to just handle a couple of housekeeping items. Um, one, you have the ability to ask questions. Um, we will do our best during the presentation, if we can, to answer those, but it's just two of us here today, uh, so our ability to answer them is probably going to be pretty limited, but feel free to an uh, ask your questions. We'll try to get to them. Second, um, CLE credits. There's some uh, slides in the beginning where they talk about CLE credits. That's about the extent of my knowledge of the CLE credit process, but we have CLE credits lined up. Uh, if you have some issues with those, let us know, but I think there's some buttons you can press and, and line up your CLE credits. Okay, so enough of that. Let me uh, introduce you to our speakers today. I'm one of them. Uh, the other is Sarah Rippey from the IEDP. You want to say hi, Sarah? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am uh, beyond excited to have Sarah here today. So the backstory is Sarah and I were talking. She's here in Colorado as well. So we were talking uh, back in the day, and I, she's doing this IEPP Weston Fellow uh, Program, Research Fellow Program. I said, well, what are you going to be doing? She says, well, I'm going to be updating our state privacy law tracker, <laughs> among many other things. But uh, you know, I said, well, Sarah, you're my new best friend, right? Uh, how about we do a webinar? Uh, and so here we are. Uh, what I'll say is uh, we've got those QR codes there. Those will take you to our LinkedIn page. Um, friend us, you know. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. I'd love to get some friend requests from you. Um, it's a good way to kind of follow what we're doing. So today is just not a, a unique day. Uh, you can kind of track what we're doing in this space over time. Okay. If you have attended one of our prior webinars, you know that I like to start with roadmaps. You know, you see where we're going. Um, we know where we're going. Um, and I think it helps you guys to anticipate, um, and especially helps with the questions as well about what we're going to talk about. So the way we're going to do it, we do some overview slides, and we're going to talk about four states individually, Virginia, Washington, New York, and Oklahoma. Um, the reason we're doing that is those are the states that we see momentum. I'm not saying that other states, things won't happen. But as we've sat down, as we've read articles, as you know, we've looked at votes, those types of things, those are the ones where we think they'll be most relevant to you guys. I think if we did this webinar next week, maybe another bill would be up there. Um, but it is. It's a snapshot in time right now. And then we'll group together the other states, which there are many, and uh, we will have, you know, we'll go through those and we'll hit some high ticket items there. I think you guys will, will get the point when we get to them. And then we'll have some summary spots as well. Um, what I, what I do want to say is, I, and, I, and I want to preface this entire webinar on this, is this is a snapshot in time, right? I think the shelf life of, you know, the contents here based on what's happening these days is, you know, maybe a couple days, <laughs> right? A couple hours. A couple hours, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, so if you're listening to this webinar, many people do listen to this webinar later. It's like Friday night or something like that, and you're listening to this webinar. Do not send me nasty emails saying that we're out of date. I'm telling you that the shelf life is limited, but I think you guys get it. Anyway, uh, beat the dead horse there. Let me go to our next slide, our overview slide, and I will turn it over to Sarah, who's going to tell you what the landscape looks like right now. Yeah, so uh, as we said, we're only going to focus on a couple bills today, but we didn't want to go through this without spending a little time on the other bills that we maybe don't see as much movement in but are worth mentioning. Um, so towards the end, we're going to discuss these a little bit, um, but we just wanted to give you a heads up on what's out there. Um, we're not going to talk about Mississippi at all um, because that one has already died. Um, same goes for North Dakota. Um, but other than that, the Virginia one, we're obviously going to be talking about. But uh, Florida, fun fact, now has to support the governor. So that one's a new one as of a couple days ago. Um, so this is the IEPP's um, state tracker. This is the map version. Um, and this current one looks like it's a little out of date, but that will be updated shortly. Um, 
but the the real value add from the IPP tracker, which you can get there through the QR code, is the chart Excel tracker. So this is basically just a map, but the tracker um, that's in the Excel form goes through and actually will tell you what the rights are, um, and then different provisions in a really quick format. So in addition to the IEPP uh, tracker, this is a new thing we are rolling out today at Hush Blackwell. Um, I think I I'm really excited about this and, and only a way that a privacy geek can get excited <laughs> about a map linking to privacy walls, right? Um, there's, uh, so, so what this is, is essentially, you know, you go to this website, and we've got the QR code, we've got the website link down there, you can get this through Biteback Wall as well. L listen, we get on these webinars and people are always saying, you know, what is the, um, what's the status of a bill, can you give me a link, um, all those types of things. This is our interactive map, you can click on the states, you can get links to the bills, um, you know, directly into the, the legislature's website. Um, so, you know, we're updating this constantly. We actually updated this this morning for Utah, which I found last night while putting together the last slide deck, last slides here. Um, so really encourage you to, to look at this, to bookmark it, to come back to it. We're going to be updating it on a regular basis and noting which ones have um, uh, come into, into, you know, get passed ultimately if that comes to pass. I am fully aware, uh, in case you're wondering, that Nevada is not colored gray. I do not accept that what Nevada did back in uh, 2019 was CCPA-like legislation. You can disagree, that's fair, <laughs> but that's the focus here is, is CCPA-like legislation. This isn't biometric information privacy laws. This isn't, you know, like what Maine did uh, with the industry sector specific one. This is the bills that you're here to listen to today, the, the CCPA specific type bills. Okay, uh, last overview slide before we dig into Virginia. Uh, we tried to put together a few thoughts on what the takeaways are of the bills we're looking at now. Sarah showed you before that there's a bunch of bills, right? I think we're up to 15 states now, uh, notwithstanding that two have uh, died, Mississippi and North Dakota. Um, number one, I think, is uh, here on the takeaways really is, is number one. Uh, there's no consistent approach. I, I expected, uh, frankly, I, I thought we would see a lot of states jump onto the CPRA um, bandwagon. You know, that was the bill that passed in November. Uh, a ballot measure, rather, that passed in November that revises the CCPA. That, that has not been the approach, uh, with one exception, which is Florida, but Florida has only done uh, an incremental approach there. There's no data protection authority involved and no regulatory um, jumping in uh, there as well, like with all the 22 regulation topics. Um, some of the concepts have been incorporated into the uh, Washington Privacy Act. And the Washington Privacy Act has become really a model for a number of other state legislations, right? That is the model for Virginia. I mean, we're going to talk Virginia first, but that's incredibly unfair. The Senator Carlisle in Washington, who, you know, drafted the Washington Privacy Act, and he's basically seeing a version of that get passed in Virginia, where he's still toiling in Washington, right? Um, so, you know, no consistent approach. We do see CCPA-like bills. We're going to have a slide that shows you that. Um, we see CCPA-like bills. We see, you know, watered-down bills, Washington Privacy Act bills. But I think this is sort of like the patchwork, right? And the number of people on Twitter are using the patchwork 2021 as sort of this approach here, and that's what we're really seeing. Another big ticket item, I think, is nobody's looking to create a data protection authority. If you've heard me talk about the CPRA, you know that that's my big thing, is California's going to have a data protection authority, and what that's going to mean is going to be significant. Nobody's jumping into that. We don't see a data protection authority. You know, two through five there, right, not to really uh, dwell on these topics. I think you know them if you've been tracking these bills. Different types of covered entities, so what's the scope? Who does it apply to? How many consumers do you, uh, information do you need to have? What are the exemptions? All those types of things. And then different uh, definitions of relevant terms, definition of sale. Um, we'll see a lot of distinctions there um, with the definitions of sale about who's putting in phrases like other valuable consideration, who's not. I mean, these very small changes in the walls can have very big impacts down the road if they actually pass. And then number five is um, common focus on, on the right to opt out of sales. I think we see that, right? That's clearly been a focus here. Um, and some of these laws, you know, taking it from the Washington Privacy Act or expanding that to like opt out of targeted advertising. 
uh, but the, really that's becoming like this U.S. approach, right, which is different than the, the, the GDPR approach, although Sarah will talk to you about Oklahoma uh, in a little bit. Okay, uh, so let's go to Virginia, and let's talk about where we are. Uh, first, you know, if you follow the blog and if you've been following the, the conversations out in uh, the legal sphere on Virginia, you'll know that a bill passed the House and a bill passed the Senate. Where we are now, though, is that the Virginia legislature is in a special session. Um, it considered the bill on Monday, and we were just looking, before we jumped on here, we were just looking at um, the history, and there was an amendment there um, having to do with uh, setting up a committee to, to look at the, the enforcement of the bill and provide guidance. Um, there, was, there was a hearing today, <laughs> I think, which obviously we, we could not attend preparing for this webinar. So what, what I'd say is with Virginia is uh, all signs point to it going forward. Roll Call had an article uh, that came out yesterday morning that talked about the bill as if, you know, it was a done deal, right? It just needs to get some votes done. Listen, anything can happen. The last thing you want to do is get out on a limb on these things. But, but all indications are this is going to pass and the governor is going to sign it. It just needs to go through the process. And it looks like there's going to be some last-minute tinkering around trying to maybe strengthen some of the enforcement provisions here. Um, so, you know, we're going to give you an overview here. What I will say is if, if we have a number of slides on Virginia, what I will say is if it passes, we'll obviously do a webinar on it, and I'll dig into it a lot more. But I do want to give you guys an understanding of what's going on because this is the big ticket item right now, privacy law. Um, I mentioned it before too. I think you have to start with this premise, right? To understand that when you had that that looks like um, section there, a more business friendly version of the 2021 Washington Privacy Act, right? When this bill first came out and we wrote on it, uh, it was like, well, hey, I, I recognize this bill. I wrote about this a week ago with the Washington Privacy Act, right? But then you get into the weeds and you're saying, well, wait a second. This isn't going to apply to as many businesses. Well, wait a second. These exemptions are a lot more business friendly here, right? And so that's what we're talking about. We'll kind of walk, walk through that. The scope here, too, is um, – but, but I think it's important, and I want to, I want to say it again because I think it's important to reiterate. It's, it's, a, it's a variation of the Washington Privacy Act, right? I mean, it's, one, it's fascinating. It really is. Because for three years, Washington has been trying to get a privacy bill across the finish line, and they haven't been able to do it because of enforcement and last year facial recognition technology as well. And now what you see is that other states are on the cusp of passing a variation of the Washington bill, and Washington still can't get it across the finish line. It's just amazing. I, 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 just, I wonder what Washington legislatures think. Maybe they're happy. Maybe they're proud of that. I don't know. But... Um, Anyway, so on the scope, right, let's talk about the scope for a second here. There is no monetary threshold. Those of you familiar with the CCPA will know that the CCPA has a threshold of $25 million annual gross revenue. That is not the case in uh, Virginia and the Washington Privacy Act as well. Um, that's significant, right? Um, the way that businesses are going to be caught up on this is going to be that 100,000 number, basically, right? It's going to be 100,000 consumers that you, you process. Um, on a calendar year. And then the definition of consumer becomes important as well, and that's going to exclude um, acting in an employment or commercial capacity, right? So getting up to that 100,000 number for consumers, for B2B businesses, um, you know, for, for companies that have large employee bases uh, in the state, it, it's, it's not a fait accompli that you're going to be subject to this law. I, I want to be honest with you on that. I think you're really going to be looking at this scope and saying, does this apply to me? And then, of course, there's the data broker one. Sarah will point out a distinction uh, between that and Washington uh, in a couple slides. This is also a big ticket item. This is the, you know, I think this slide is like when all of my GLBA uh, attendees, you know, click the, uh, uh, the X out button on the slide deck, right? And when they realize that this bill has a GLBA exemption, and it's not just as it is right now, and we'll see if it comes to pass, but it's not just data like CCPA. It's a straight up, if you are subject to GLBA, you're exempt. Straight up. Same for HIPAA. Um, that, that's a lot more business friendly than, um, than CCPA uh, and, and Washington Privacy Act as well. Uh, one of these ways in which the bill was really, really modified to be more business friendly. What I'm going to say is if you're a financial institution, don't leave. There's a lot more to talk about here. But, but yeah, I mean, it's a big deal. 
Uh, and then you see the other exemptions as well, nonprofits, higher education institutions. Those, those come relevant when we get to talk about Washington and what they're doing. Washington Post, yeah. Personal data, again, another important thing to point out for being more business friendly. At the definition itself, you'll, you'll recognize that. That's, you know, it's very close to GDPR, right? The publicly available is really where the action goes on here, right? And it's not the first bullet point. We know that from CCPA. It's the second bullet point. And this is the way the CPRA is also going to approach public, uh, publicly available. It's no longer going to be in the CPRA that it has to be in, you know, government records for it to be publicly available. The change that they're making here, and it's, and it's reflected here in the, in the Virginia bill, is um, if the business has a reasonable basis to believe it's lawfully made available, right? The business has a basis, right? So what are we talking about? We're talking about data scraping. We're talking about your Facebook profile. We're talking about those, you know, if you're, if you're at a law firm, your website, your LinkedIn profile, those types of things, right? That is a huge <laughs> fundamental change in the way that we approach personal data. It is. And it's reflected in the CPRA, and it's also reflected in, in Virginia as well. Okay, uh, but, you know, I've talked about business-friendly stuff, so I think it's only fair that I talk about, you know, privacy-friendly stuff, because I imagine we have privacy people on here who are cursing at me <laughs> under their breath <laughs> right now, right? This is a big deal for privacy advocates, and this is something that they will point to, and they will say, but wait, you know, there's, there's some significant stuff that we go beyond, and it, it is true, it is true. Um, for sensitive data, and we've got the definition there, it's going to be, consent's going to be required to process sensitive data. Um, this is, you know, CCPA approaches this with, with well, since CC, CCPA doesn't have any sensitive data category. CPRA will have a, a sensitive data category, and it will have the, um, the right to opt out, essentially, right, of processing of, of sensitive data subject to a number of exemptions. Uh, this goes beyond, and in fairness to privacy advocates, this goes beyond, and it's consent for uh, processing and sensitive data. Um, and this will be something I think that if the bill passes that we're gonna hear a lot about, right? GDPR is, is coming into play here, right? This is like an Article 9, quasi-Article 9 approach towards it. But it goes C beyond CCPA, it goes beyond CTRA, and in fairness, we should talk about that. And then consent's also required for incompatible and necessary purposes, you can see that there, I think. I think you get that. All right, the rights, um, if you know GDPR, you will recognize a number of these rights, uh, with the exception of, I think, the last one, the opt-out of targeted advertising, sale of personal data, and certain types of profiling, like this opt-out, right? But the other rights, I think, you know, you read them, you say, yeah, those, those look familiar, Dave, we really don't need to talk about them, move on, right? So, fairness, I will move on. Sale. I've mentioned this before, though, right? Get into the weeds on these bills because it really matters. The definition of sale here is an exchange of personal data for monetary consideration by the controller to a third party. And you say, oh, wait, wait, Dave, you, you've got a typo, right? You're, you're missing the uh, monetary or other valuable uh, okay. <laughs> reference here. I'm not. This is, this is it. And, and, you know, they got rid of that phrase, other valuable, uh, which has vexed privacy attorneys for two years out of the CCPA. Uh, the AG's office in California thinks we know exactly what it means, and I guess everybody's entitled to their opinion. Uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been an issue, right? Um, so it's not there, and, and that's, that's tightening the definition here, and I think that's significant. And then you see these exclusions here, disclosures of processors. I think that becomes a big, comes into big play. Um, you know, who do you line up as your processor? Who can qualify as a processor, right? All those types of things that, if this passes, we're going to be thinking about for two years, right? Because uh, the effective date is in 2023. And then number four there gets back to this point I was making on the publicly available, right? It's not a sale if you disclose information that uh, the consumer intentionally made available to the general public, right? This is data scraping. Again, um, you see that, and that's a big business-friendly uh, type of approach here. The other phrase, and it's funny because yesterday Sarah and I had our, our prep session, and I said, we got to cut slides down. We have too many <laughs> slides, right? And she said, okay, okay, and we cut a couple of her slides, and I thought that about it. And then last night at like 10 o'clock, I, I added this slide, right? And so I felt like kind of a jerk <laughs> adding this slide, but uh, nonetheless, here it is. Uh, but I thought you would, you would want it, right? Um, what is the definition of targeted advertising? H here it is. Um, I think the play here is going to be, and it's, I mean, look, it's like cookies, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're really talking about to cut, to cut through it. Um, whether cookies are as relevant in 2023, 
as they are today remain to be seen. Um, but there's a lot to be said here, right, about the juxtaposition of sale versus uh, targeted advertising. I mean, we've been thinking about cookies as sales under CCPA for a couple of years now. And now to have a different phrase, targeted advertising, I think really gives us a lot to think about. And it's also interesting, too, is we, we don't see in Virginia, we don't see this requirement to put a do not sell link on your website footer, right? So how this ends up coming into play, and fortunately, we've got time if it passes to think about this, but these are the issues that I think we're really going to be thinking about for the next couple of years. Consumer requests uh, looks a lot like CCPA, right? Uh, with the exception of the third one, controller must establish an appeal procedure. Um, interesting, right? Interesting approach here, but you know, ultimately, uh, I think you guys will get that across the finish line. Other provisions, uh, privacy policy, shocker. Absolutely shocking, you're gonna to have to update your privacy policy. I know, I mean, I'm breaking news here, right, on, the, on this webinar. Uh, I, sometimes I even wonder why I put that in. But right? of course you have to update your privacy policy, right? That's, that's like step one. Uh, data processing agreements, similar but not identical to uh, Article 28. Um, you're gonna be going through this anyway. The CPRA has new um, you know, requirements for contracts um, that you're gonna to have to be going through this anyway, right? And a lot of the companies do this anyway, they do it with DPAs. Um, data protection assessments, though, that's, that's new. I think we will see that come out of the CC, CPRA with their risk of heightened processing, but we, you know, we got a lot to learn on the CPRA. But data protection assessments are going to be required for some sort of activities like sales and targeted advertising, profile, those types of things. Um, a lot to flesh out there, but you know, a lot of interesting things and, and, and different, right? Different than the CCPA, CPRA um, as we talk it through. Enforcement. This is the good news, no prior right of action. Uh, AG enforcement, 30 days to cure, 7,500. You recognize this, right? This is, um, this is the CCPA approach right now, right? One caveat, I mentioned that roll call article uh, that came out yesterday. They said, uh, they reported the state attorney general would put, uh, would create a new enforcement uh, division and that they would put an annual budget of $400,000 towards, uh, Towards this, and that'd be supplemented with fines and policies. So, 400 grand. Um, you know, in context, you know, the CPR, the California Privacy Protection Agency out in California, the DPA, is going to have a 10 million dollar budget. So, I don't know what 400 grand is. You know, it's, well, I, I don't. Yeah, I, it is what it is, right? I mean, it's 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 interesting, right? But maybe maybe it's a first step, and and you know, and we'll see how it goes. But it is kind of interesting to see the roll call uh, reported as such. Okay, effective date, January 1st, 2023. We will ruin another Christmas season like we did a couple years ago with the CCPA. Uh, and I also put up the dates there on the, the CPRA, the California Privacy Rights Act, because I think you'd want that for reference, right? Um, and there, the next big date is going to be that uh, July 1st, 2022 adoption of regulations, final regs. There's going to be a lot that goes on before that. I think you know it, the draft regs, all that type of stuff. But to kind of place this into context about what's looking like your compliance uh, program. Okay, I'm done for now. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and she's going to talk uh, about Washington. All righty. So Washington um, this year actually has two bills that have been introduced, um, one in the House and one in the Senate. Um, the Senate one is just the Washington Privacy Act. It's um, Senator Carlisle's 2021 version of the WPA. Um, the other one is in the House, and that is the Washington People's Privacy Act. And that was um, drafted with the help of the um, Washington ACLU. So in terms of broad, far-reaching privacy legislation bills that we've seen, that's probably one of the further-reaching ones. Um, but for our purposes today, we're going to focus mostly on the Washington Privacy Act is because we see the most movement there. So starting out, I want to let everyone know that the next couple slides, there's no technology glitch. There's, they're just going to look really similar to Virginia. <laughs> um, and that's because, as Dave said, the bill is incredibly similar to Virginia, um, not only in the substantive provisions, but the direct language. Um, that had been borrowed from Senator Carlisle. Um, so quick status update, um, it's 
currently in committee. Um, the original bill has been substituted, and I just saw this morning um, that in the past couple days they are looking to substitute another version. So with regard to scope, um, this is almost identical to the definition under Virginia. Um, the one big difference here is instead of deriving over 50% of gross revenue from the sale of personal data, Washington only requires 25. So it's just a much lower threshold um, for data brokers there. But other than that, it's functionally the same. Um, another thing that Dave alluded to earlier was that the exclusions were slightly narrower under Washington, and that is definitely true. Um, so with GLBA, um, for one, there is the exemption, but it's only for personal data. So whereas Virginia had an exemption for the entity itself, this one is limited to the data itself. Um, and the same with HIPAA and healthcare information, the exemptions are still there, they're just slightly narrower. Um, and then regarding nonprofits and higher education institutions, there is an exemption for the time being, um, but that is going to be phased out. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about the effective dates, but for the time being, those exemptions are there. So back to Virginia, and this is essentially the same thing the, for the definition of personal data. Um, the one big difference here is for the exclusions, you don't have that long list regarding the business's reasonable belief um, of information that has been made public. So here it's a very objective approach where has the information been made available through federal, state, or local government records, yes or no. Um, you don't look to see whether it's been on social media. It's just much more black and white here. So not going to spend much time on this slide. Again, the exact same language as Virginia. Um, and same goes for this slide. Everything Dave said about Virginia holds true for this. So here's where the difference happens, and that's in sale. Um, and as Dave mentioned earlier, Virginia got rid of the or other valuable consideration. Um, Washington did no such thing, and they agree with the California AG that that should be included, and it's clearly easy to figure out from their perspective. <laughs> so that's still there. We are still left to know what exactly that means. So that's a fun problem that we still get to play with. Um, again, I don't want to sound like a broken record over here, but same as Virginia, um, 45 days to respond plus 45 day extension. You have to let the consumer know within the original 45 days about that you're taking the extension. Um, same appeal procedure, same language. Um, so, again, this is mostly just here for your reference. Same thing as Virginia. The privacy policy, got to update it, um, got to disclose collection processing rights, um, and a bunch of other things that are too long to go over right now. Um, so, for enforcement, there is no private right of action which has been a big point of contention with Senator Carlisle, and in this iteration, it has been given up. Um, the enforcement by the Attorney General, 30 days to cure a violation, and then 7,500 per violation. So regarding the effective date, the, um, the bulk of the bill would go into effect July 31st, 2022. Um, however, that's there are three different effective dates. So as I was referring to earlier when I was discussing these exclusions, um, the 
exemptions regarding institutions of higher learning and nonprofits. Um, that will be phased out by July 31st, 2026. Um, so we've got a couple years there to ease into it. And then this last part I want to mention, um, we're not going to go too in-depth into it. Um, don't panic when you see that it says it takes effect immediately. Um, parts two and three of the bill uh, regard, are um, regarding public health emergencies. So in this iteration, um, the drafters essentially threw in a COVID provision. So they have separate sections that talk about public health emergencies. Um, and those are the ones that take effect immediately. But the bulk of the bill is not enforceable or ineffective, excuse me, for a year. So that was the Washington Privacy Act. Now we're going to move on to just a brief couple slides of the People's Privacy Act. Um, so this one, we are not expecting it to get as much traction. It hasn't really moved since it was introduced. So it's currently in committee and it's been there. Um, the scope is incredibly broad. It applies to all non-governmental entities that have a revenue of over $10 million per year through 300 or more transactions. Additionally, um, you can fall under this if you process or maintain the personal information of a thousand or more unique individuals. That is low. That is extremely low when you compare to every other bill that has been proposed all over the country. I think the lowest alternative is at 100,000. Yeah, or 50,000, 50, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's just, I mean, incredibly broad. But personal information, the definition, CCPA-like, it's nothing new there. The rights aren't super out there. Um, they're pretty common. The right to access, no, delete, correct, refuse consent for non-essential processing. Um, and then they added this new one of the right not to be subject to surreptitious surveillance. So we don't really know what that means, but under the People's Privacy Act, that would be a right. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it'll end up being things like, not to jump in, I think it'll end it. up being things like use of your camera on your smartphone. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they have in mind with, I can't say, Start to put this right. I'll, I'll stumble over <laughs> my side. <laughs> but, I think, but it's but it's it's unique, right? To your point, it's it's unique in, in the People's Privacy Act for sure. Yeah. Um, and then privacy policy. Again, this one's going to be fun because it requires you to have two. Um, so you have to have a form, long form and a short form policy. Um, it, basically, the short form is just a condensed version of the long one with the like key provisions. Um, other than that, enforcement, private right of action, as well as AG enforcement. And they, they also threw in BIPA, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so on top of all of this, they also decided to throw in uh, a carbon copy of the Illinois Biometric mm -hmm. Information Privacy Act, which is also interesting because Washington already has a biometric information privacy law. It just doesn't have a private right of action. So as you said, this is the ACLU's of Washington's um, uh, version. Action project. <laughs> yeah, this is like everything that they want, right? It, it is what it is. I mean, they, yeah, they, they submit this. Now, now, what's really actually kind of, we talked about this yesterday, right, what's really interesting, and, and credit to uh, Joe Jerome for putting this out on Twitter, is the ACLU of Virginia is like trumpeting <laughs> the, the Virginia uh, privacy bill as like, a huge breakthrough, and the ACLU of Washington is, is obviously, you know, very much dislikes the, um, you know, the Washington Privacy Act, given, given this bill. Um, so it remains to be seen. I mean, as you said, nothing, nothing's happened here. Um, with this bill here, whether this is proposed to make compromises between this and Senator Carlisle's bill, the Washington Privacy Act, I suppose, remains to be seen. It, it's funny, too. I, I feel this. I, I, I'm sitting here while you were going through your slides, and I, I just, like, every time I just want to chime in and, and feel this, like, overwhelming need to, like, to like reiterate that you know Washington Privacy Act did it first, right? Mm -hmm. And like you know, you know that Virginia has. I just 
you know, Virginia stole it, right? And they're going to pass it and steal all their thunder, right? It's just, it's just <laughs> a remarkable type thing that we're seeing uh, with prophecy law now. Um, yeah, and I think, I think I didn't mention Virginia. I don't think I did, but I, I do think it's notable, right, for us to point out when we're talking with Washington and we're talking about uh, Virginia, if, if one of these states passes it, uh, it certainly looks like Virginia is, is incredibly close, uh, it will actually be the first voluntary passage of a privacy bill. I and mean, we have to keep in mind that, that California was a ballot measure. And you know, McTaggart held all the cards, right, to get the California the initial AB 375 passed um, across the finish line. And because he had the ballot measure ready to, to rock and roll, and the CPRA was a version of the ballot measure as well. So, you know, don't lose the significance of a legislature potentially really actually passing privacy legislation. That's a big deal in this country. Okay. I, that was great. I, I um uh, we're talking about New York now, uh, not to do an abrupt change of pace. So, you know, the question is, uh, why are we talking about New York? Uh, I'll give you an overview here. There are, there are currently five bills. There's actually more, to be honest with you. Um, these are the ones we kind of, like, weeded down into the ones that were mostly, um, like, CCPA-like, and even that's probably uh, a little bit um, uh, gracious to some of these bills and their scopes. Uh, but the reason why we're talking about New York is, is this, right? And this caught everyone's attention um, a couple weeks ago where the governor of New York, Cuomo, came out and said, hey, I'm going to be pushing privacy legislation this year. And Sarah mentioned, you know, Florida. We saw that a couple of days ago, and we'll talk about that bill in a little bit. Um, this is why New York is being talked about individually. It's not because of any mo movement in the bills themselves, but you get a governor saying that you're going to do something uh, as part of, of his, uh, you know, state of the state address, that's, that's traction. And that's, I think, the things that, you know, out here that we look for is in the privacy industry. So take you just through a, a nickel tour of the, of the bills here, New York Privacy Act. Th this would be sort of like your all-in privacy regime, right? Comprehensive legislation, consumer consent, private right of action, you know, this is the grab bag of, of really what privacy advocates want to see, right? Um, so, you know, does that have a chance to pass in New York? I, I don't know. We can't, you know, target handicap any of these things, but like this is the more fully fleshed out bill. The other ones that we have, um, consumer control of personal information, you know, CCPA-like, right? Obviously, that's a much different um, type of a bill. And I just assume when we say CCPA, like you guys have dealt with CCPA, right? So you know what that is. Um, but it's that approach, it's that, you know, uh, transparent notice on the front end, opt out on the back end. The Right to Know Act, um, you know, really focused on right to access, right to know certain types of information, as its title would suggest. Uh, and then the last two here, it's your Data Act and the Online Consumer Protection Act. Um, again, not sensing much movement with these bills here, um, but worth sort of noting that they exist out there. And some of these bills, too, have been proposed in prior sessions. I think one of these bills actually goes back like 10 years or something like that. Yeah, it was kind of interesting looking at it. Um, you know, it's, I, and I think I, this is the last slide on, on New York, so maybe I can kind of like put a final point on it, is absent Cuomo coming out and saying, I'm going to push privacy legislation. I don't think we'd be talking about New York, right? It, it, we're, I mean, as a jurisdiction, as a state, man, that seems like a heavy lift to get New York across the finish line on, on privacy legislation. And I, I know, you know, New York did the Shield Act, um, but man, this seems like there would be a lot of people, given the size, right? Given the sheer size of the state, um, the business interest there. Um, this, we're going to watch it. We're going to watch it very closely. We're going to see what Cuomo uh, decides to do here. He's got his hands full with other things right now as well. Um, but it's going to be on our radar as we're talking about. Uh, on that note, um, you may be surprised to find Oklahoma <laughs> <laughs> as being called out here. Uh, but I'll let Sarah jump in and talk to you about that. Yeah, um, when Dave asked me to join in on this webinar, I don't know what I thought we would be talking about, but it was not Oklahoma. Um, but so Oklahoma, the main reason that we're talking about it is um, that it is a opt-in consent structure, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, 
But just brief overview, there are currently two bills that have been introduced. The first one is an act relating to data transparency, somewhat similar to CCPA, but it's more like the California Online Privacy Protection Act, or CalOPA, super limited scope, not really worth talking about much today. Um, the one that we really want to focus on is the Oklahoma Computer Data Privacy Act. Um, and one more thing that I want to say to highlight here is if this were passed, um, it would become effective November 21st of this year. So if this does pass in this current iteration, it's going to be quick. One of the many challenges yeah. of, of Oklahoma, right? You'd be taking your pain very quickly instead of yes. small doses, right? Yeah. Um, so scope, uh, annual gross revenue in excess of $10 million. So again, fairly low when you compare with the $25 million that we've seen where there is a threshold. Um, obviously, Virginia and Washington don't have those thresholds, um, but for those that do, this is a fairly low amount. Um, the 50,000 individuals um, or consumers or households or devices. So CCPA-like um, with the data broker provision, um, this is like the Washington Privacy Act where it's 25% or more of the annual revenue. Uh, with regard to GLBA and HIPAA, it's pretty much the same as the CCPA, as well as the definition of personal information. Rights and sales, I'm not going to spend much time here, um, except to say that they don't actually define the term sale. Uh, they, it's not a defined term. They do make an attempt to define it, but they end up using the term sales within the definition. So if this does get passed, it's another fun experiment an exercise in trying to figure out what that means. So it's like it says like sale equals sale. Is that what it is? Pretty much. <laughs> Another business sells. <laughs> Fantastic. I can't wait to spend hours thinking about that. <laughs> All right. So here is the big piece of the puzzle, which is why we're talking about Oklahoma today. So pretty much every other US state privacy legislation that has been introduced is an opt out model. Um, anyone even remotely familiar with the CCPA, you know, you have to have the do not sell my personal information. Um, but here they have switched it to an opt in consent. So, whereas other states have done that for sensitive information, um, here it's all information. And it's not just the sale, but it's also the collection. Um, so, that's just way broader than anything we've seen before. Um, and it must be made in the absence of any mechanism that has the purpose or substantial effects of obscuring, subverting, or impairing the decision making, Just which even narrows that possibility even further of how to move forward here. Clear as a bill. Crystal <laughs> clear. Uh, regarding enforcement, it's not too far out there in terms of what we've seen in the past, but uh, it's enforced by, enforced by the Oklahoma Corporation Commission. Um, 2,500 per violation, um, 7,500 if it was intentional. Interesting thing here is that the private right of action um, provides for the same recovery. So a private right of action. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think I'll, you know, I'll say something that I, I don't know that I'll ever say again in my life, which is keep your eyes on Oklahoma, <laughs> right? Um, I, I mean, when you look at it, right, and I think it's worth talking about as well. I mean, it, it, the bill has bipartisan support. I mean, it has many co-authors on the bill. It passed out of a committee. Um, I think it has like 40 yeah. people that have signed on. And it's, you know, Oklahoma's a red state, right? And you see that as well in Florida, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of interesting as well, I think, right, which is, are we seeing a sea change where the Democrats have been, you know, pro-privacy, and now the Republicans are actually getting pro-privacy? I have my suspicions as to why, because of, you know, the anxiety the Republicans have with, with tech right now and how they get followed on tech and those types of things. I think that's undercurrent 
of some of this, but you do see Republican, you know, governors and legislatures coming out strong. I mean, this is a strong bill. If this passes, it's big time. I mean, we talked about this yesterday, right? And you said it before, low threshold for applicability, $10 million, lower than the CCPA's $25 million. Consent for collection, a brutal definition of consent, doesn't even use GDPR's definition of consent. Private right of action and statutory damages, all right? And, and bipartisan support. So we'll wait and see what happens. So, yeah, Oklahoma, right, of all places that if we were playing privacy ball bingo that nobody would have picked, right, it's something else. One last thing I want to throw in there is um, one of the co-sponsors, when asked about the definition of sale and how it's not defined, his response was, I think the lawyers can figure it out. <laughs> so I think it's worth, you know, we're talking about it, right? We're, we're talking about the coast. Listen, I mean, the Washington Privacy Act itself, right, uh, passed out of the Senate the first year, passed out of the Senate the second year. Um, last year, it also, a version of it passed out of the Assembly. They couldn't reconcile the two versions, you know, prior rate of action being really the big, the, the big sticking point, others, but the, the big sticking point. So, you know, just because something passes out of committee is not uh, indicative of, of it passing ultimately. But again, you know, when we talk about these states that we really kind of focus on, that gets your attention. How could it not, right? Get your attention when you see a bill like this with broad support pass out of committee and you're saying, what, what is going on here, right? Especially with this, all these things we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, let's talk about other states then. And, and yes, the answer to the question, I, I did make this as, as small as possible to type. Um, here, here's the problem, right? So we did this, and it looked really nice. And then last night at 10 o'clock, I'm looking around, making sure I've got all balls, all bills accounted for, <laughs> right? And I stumble on Utah, which had been proposed yesterday, uh, literally proposed yesterday. So we had to add Utah, and that, that kind of messed with everything. But, you know, the point of this slide here, right, is to take these other bills, Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Kentucky, uh, Minnesota, South Carolina, Utah, and just to kind of compare, and we're going to have three slides on this, to kind of compare these things we've been talking about with respect to these other bills, right? So um, some – but but it's not indicative of, you know, tomorrow one of these bills could, you know, require a deep dive into it, right? There's been talk about maybe Minnesota might see some traction there. Clearly, Sarah mentioned before in Florida that the governor came out, um, and that was only introduced two days ago, right? So it hasn't had a chance or momentum. You see that with Arizona, too, February 11th, right? There are a couple state legislatures who have not um, opened yet. There's also talk in Colorado that uh, we get a bill in Colorado. So it's a snapshot in time. I think we're going to see, you know, more to come here, right? Um, what I think is worth talking about, though, with this column is, well, there's a number of things. I like to think I don't put content up there that's irrelevant, so I think that everything up here is kind of interesting to talk about. Uh, but, you know, when you look like the look, the looks like bill, you've got modified CCPA, GDPR, CCPA matched up. Honestly, I don't know what's going on in Arizona. I mean, you read the bill, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's going on there, right? It's interesting. Say it that way. Florida is modified CPRA. Kentucky is a short version of the CCPA. Uh, same thing with Minnesota. South Carolina is like a biometric opt-out bill, right? It's not like if a, it's like opt-out and consent, so it's kind of like it, but it's enough of a flavor of CCPA. We think it's worth including. And then Utah, last night looking at that one, that looks like they took Virginia. It looks like they took Virginia, which is the CDPA. Um, that's the acronym um, uh, Consumer Data Protection Act there that we're using for Virginia right now. Um, so Utah is, is grabbing Virginia, right, which is Washington Privacy Act. If, if you don't know that by now in our webinar, <laughs> say it one more time. So, again, I mean, we talked about this at the beginning, right, about what, what are these bills really kind of – this is the patchwork 2021 that people are worried about, right? This is the patchwork. And then when you go to the scope as well, you see, you know, Alabama would be doing business, basically, in the state, Right. And then, um, you know, Arizona's got its own unique way of kind of doing You have to be at $25 million and do other things. It's not independent qualifications in addition to, right, a, a qualifier there. Uh, but then you got the same as CCPA, same as CCPA, similar. Um, South Carolina doing business in the state and that biometric one. And then Utah is, you know, Utah is back to that, that, that Virginia one, that 100000 that we were talking about before. Um, why variation? 
wide variation. And it kind of remains to be seen, too, whether these bills will kind of be tinkered with along the way, especially as, you know, what happens in Virginia, if that one gets across the finish line at Washington, if the compromises need to be made in Washington to get that across the finish line. There's just, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, next slide, we, you know, the personal information um, definition. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, Kentucky stands alone. They refer to their um, destruction of records statute. Um, the others are ones that you'll be familiar with, the CCPA-like definition. Again, that's, you know, the one we had a laundry list of data elements, GDPR one being just the, you know, the, the, the phrase, you know, reasonably capable of being associated with type phrase. Um, and then the rights, right? Uh, changes here, right? I mean, not, not always the same rights. Kentucky is this opt-out of sales. South Carolina has, it's all, it's all biometric with South Carolina, right, again. Um, and so it's, it's all these, these rights put around, around biometric information. We do see access and no, but then you get things like Arizona where they have confirmed processing, and that's also in, in Utah as well. It's really interesting to think, you know, as this is sort of playing out, that people could have different rights depending upon Geography, and I, I say it's interesting. We, we knew that was going to happen, right? I mean, as these bills played out, but even here, where you would say, like, you know, can we at least come up with the same rights and 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 have those across the country? It's not. I mean, and Sarah pointed out, that the, you know, the issues with like defining terms like sales and those types of things. Um, Patchwork 2021 is really it's alive and doing well with these bills. It really is. <laughs> And then the, the final uh, one on, on, on this one, and then we'll, we'll talk about a few other things, is uh, enforcement and effective dates, right? Um, my favorites are always one that's are not stated. I imagine that those are, I mean, there's defaults, right? I mean, under certain state constitutions, there are default dates for when things go into effect, but those tend to be quick. Um, so if something's not stated, I just assume it's really quick. Um, but then you've got 2022, actually, it's 2022 across the board here. Uh, and then... Virginia was what, January 1st, 2023, right? So, but I think Washington we thought was earlier, right? Um, gosh, it's hard to keep track of all of them, even with a slide deck in front of you. Uh, but, you know, these, this, and what this screams, right? And I don't know if this is going to come to pass, clearly, right? There's a long way to go here. But what this screams is what our clients tell us in regular basis, which is how, how do we not be, um, reactionary to everything that happens? How do we come up with a privacy program that we can just take these new laws and, and put them in place? That's what the screen is. Um, there are private rights of action here. You know, uh, you know some of them relating to, to data breaches, um, uh, you know, similar to what the CCPA's approach is, right? You see it with Alabama and, and Florida. Uh, South Carolina is, 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 is out there. Um, so 72 hours to notify residents of a breach or a $5,000 fine per resident, that adds up, right? Uh, and that's biometric as well, right? So it's limited, right? This is not, you know, this is not data breach notification straight up. It's biometric. But that's 72 hours to notify residents. And I haven't dug into the weeds on, like, what the definition of breach is and when that starts. But anybody who's done breach response, and we've done a lot here, obviously, man, I mean, it's one thing, you know, remember, GDPR is 72 hours, right? You're probably thinking, well, it's GDPR. No, it's not 72 hours in GDPR to notify data subjects. It's 72 hours to notify supervisory authorities, right? That's filling in a, a form online, right? That is not like letters to people providing notice. That's something else. And then, you know, there's also a private right of action. If you violate that, there's a private right of action. So South Carolina is one of those ones where, I don't know, if that got some momentum, maybe that's the, you know, the, the Oklahoma uh, discussion that we were having before. It remains to be seen. I mean, it remains to be seen. These bills are out there. Um, uh, you know, encourage you to use the, the, the privacy trackers that we were pointing out at the beginning to kind of stay on top of these. Uh, two other states worth noting, Connecticut and Vermont. These are, for the time being, based on best, best we can tell, these are short, uh, short form bills, uh, placeholders for forthcoming legislation. Um, so it remains to be seen. You know, we've got them on a tracker, on, on the Hush tracker, and I think Sarah's got on the IPV tracker. We'll see what happens on these ones. Um, you know, it's not much really to be said, right? The parents of the bills, yeah. Uh, one other set of bills 
just to make you aware of. Um, we have not focused on them. We will not focus on them other than to flag them for you because it's, it's a big deal, right? This is, we mentioned BIPA before, the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. I think if you're out there, you probably are aware of this, this nasty legislation in Illinois where if you collect without, collect biometrics without consent, um, give you a short form version of it, and you know, you have that disclosures in regards to retention and all those types of things, uh, you can be on the hook for um, a class action lawsuit, right, for statutory damages. Three states considering similar bills, Maryland, Massachusetts, and New York. Um, haven't seen a lot of movement here on these bills, but really this is about, I think, just kind of wanting to make you aware that these exist um, and, and make sure we're trying to take at least a holistic approach to these privacy laws. But these aren't, I don't have these on my tracker, um, so we, we have to put the bill numbers here in case you want to uh, catch up with them. Okay. Last section, uh, which is our summary slides. We have three summary slides, and we are, I think, tracking right on time for once. Um, this is our attempt to take all of the, uh, the bills that we have here and try to, we were talking before, right, we were saying things like, you yeah, know, who was 50,000, who was 100,000, all those types of things, right? Um, so this is really our attempt to try to, try to relay that and something that you could, you could take Again, susceptible to change, uh, you know, but this is where things stand right now. Again, that Oklahoma one, the $10 million threshold, really kind of interesting. And then, you know, Sarah uh, pointed out the People's Privacy Act there, right, that, that 1,000 1, consumers. I mean, those are the ones that really kind of stand out. I think you see, it's interesting, I didn't, you know, just this is just alphabetical, but you see Florida, Kentucky, and, and Minnesota being this 25, you know, lining up there. Kentucky is interesting. It, it, you know, on the for-profit one, it just says commercial purposes, um, not defined. Uh, but I think that's their version of saying for-profit. You know, uh, I know we have a lot of a lot of universities that attend these these webinars, uh, and that's of interest to you. Um, that for-profit designation there, right? Um, and in South Carolina, is basically, I mean, my goodness, we were talking about that before, right? Um, that's just basically you're doing business in the state. Really interesting one there. That's that biometric one. Um, it is interesting, the 100,000 consumers, we talked about that before and the threshold that that is. Um, it's interesting that we've seen centered around there. That, that will be where the CPRA moves towards. Um, but again, it's the counting of consumers that I think becomes notable. Look at the definition of consumers and see if it includes B2B and employees, right? That really becomes important when you're counting these numbers. Uh, the next two slides then are our uh, one on GLBA and one on HIPAA. We talked a lot about this. I know we have a lot of financial institutions that like to join these webinars, a lot of uh, healthcare organizations as well. So we want to be responsive to you guys. This is where things stand right now. Right? Entity exemption is, you know, you're subject to, to GLBA, you're out, which is interesting. With that, not the CCPA approach, not the CPRA approach. Uh, Virginia, you see the checkbox there. Utah, Utah, like I said before, is really like a, a Virginia version. Uh, a clone there, uh, and then Kentucky's got its own out-of-out bill. The rest information exemptions, um, People's Privacy Act, nothing. Uh, Minnesota, nothing. South Carolina, nothing. So some patchworks there, and then New York is, of course, the it depends, <laughs> right, given the number of bills there. Uh, I don't know how we can relay that in a, in a chart. I think you guys get that. Okay, um, HIPAA exemption, similar. You know, very similar type of approach here, right? Um, the checkbox just telling you the entity information. And, and this, again, I mean, HIPAA one, I think, is, is really, you know, you know the way the CCPA approaches it, right? And that's kind of what we're trying to relay here with the entity and the information exemption, right? Um, and so, but I would encourage you, you know, if this is important to you, take a look at the actual language. I do think that there's analysis to be done here that really can't quite come through by just using check marks on boxes here. Uh, but I think this at least gives you a flavor of what you would look, what would you would expect to see if you went into um, those bills and were looking at language. Okay, so that's it for the substance. I will, um, I always call this my my shameless plug portion of the webinar. Uh, we've got a blog. Um, you should subscribe. There's a QR code there. Uh, what I will say is, and again, like I said it before, snatch on time, right? Um, this is the way we're going to be talking to you for the next uh, you know, few months on these issues. So I encourage you to sign up. There will be a way to sign up through um, the post 
questionnaire process. But if you go here, use the QR code or go to bitebackwall.com. I'd love for you to follow you. I consider it, you know, a real treat to have uh, anybody subscribe. We, we try to put out good content um, and, and timely content on there. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, you know, we're, we're pushing out the content there as well, so it's another way to kind of keep track of us. And then, you know, we've got previous webinars um, that we've done, all things CCPA, CPRA, GDPR, anything like that. With that, we've hit our hour mark, so I'm going to be respectful of your time. Let me let Sarah jump in and say goodbye. Yeah, it's um, thank you all for joining us today. I think I want to close with the fact that I just got a notification on my computer letting me know that this presentation is already outdated <laughs> as of right now. Um, Connecticut looks like they officially published and introduced, so I'll, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> the shelf life on our thing was, was not even until the time we finished. Yep. Right? Okay. Well, with that, listen again, thanks so much for attending um, this. We really appreciate it and hope to see you in the future as well.